was going to say that last night we had a, a very good session. Uh, the boys at the back end of the boat uh, really did well. But I, I'm just remembering from my youth, and that really is a long time ago, there was a lovely article in one of these sort of sailing compendiums about crewing. It was written by actually a skipper. They obviously some insight because he saw crews as farmers and their job was to take their prize pig to market. So you can make what you like of that as crews, but that, that was how he described the crew's job as getting the helmsman primed, plumped up and ready to go. So uh, can I thank all three of you, uh, Andy, Dale and Phil for uh, taking part in this. Uh, I'm looking forward to hearing what you say, you're saying. I've advised my crew to, she's working tonight to get the recording. So uh, looking forward to it very much and off you go and thank you very much. No okay, thank you, uh, Curly, and um, welcome everybody to uh, this evening's chat. Um, we're going to do it in a slightly different format uh, to last night in that um, I'm going to act as a bit of an informed interviewer, if you like. and. Um, I'm going to give um, Andy and Phil a bit of a grilling uh, as they into their experience and uh, techniques and uh, all that good stuff. Um, really pleased that Andy's been able to join us, obviously five times world champion, um, so you're not going to get uh, many more experience than that. And Phil also from Ginger Boats. Um, I, I'm not... Um, I know Phil's been going out like an absolute train in, a, in, his, uh, in his boats recently, especially with the, with the sails on. And uh, it was only when I was looking earlier, Phil, I realised that you won two of the last uh, the races at the last Worlds as well. So uh, yes. obviously more than qualified to be uh, through this evening. So yeah, thanks very much, guys. Really appreciate it. Um, so just looking at what, what we're going to go through tonight, um, we've got... Um, uh, we, we discussed it amongst ourselves before joining and uh, we're, we're not going to completely wing it. Um, so last night we obviously had the helms um, speaking, from the, speaking from the comfort of the helms uh, uh, seat, if you like, at the back of the boat and uh, went through the campaign planning and looking at some of the tactics. And um, tonight we thought we'd look uh, more, obviously from a, very much from a cruise perspective, but... Um, thinking more about you know, sort of in the boat on, you know, and, do, and doing the race itself. So we, we thought a good um, method would be to sort of, you know, thinking about what, what we're thinking about arriving at the dinghy park uh, for, to, before we go uh, on the water for the day and then go through the sequence of, of, of uh, getting out to the, um, the start line, thinking about the start, the first beat, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it gives us a bit of a structure and a bit of order. Um, uh, to, to, to you know the, the, the stuff that we do um, thinking also about um, how we adjust um, the boat because uh, obviously the crew will probably uh, do most of the, the tweaking to the, uh, the boat um, for different wind conditions and different legs of the course um, and, and yeah so that, that's going to be the flow uh, of, of the evening um, I think we're up to 25 uh, participants now so um, you know, feel free to to chip in uh, with questions as we go. Uh, don't don't hold back. Um, might have to sort of employ the shepherd's crook if we uh, if we're getting bogged down in something and, and we want to move on. Um, I'm going to be sharing my screen um, from time to time. I've got some really good video clips um, from 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 over the years, and um, I'll, I'll do that. But uh, for those that have joined late. Um, I, I don't know how familiar you are with Zoom. I know I wasn't, but over in the top right, you've got gallery view um, or speaker view, and uh, you can you can toggle between those. Uh, I'd recommend using speaker view, and it focuses on the person that's doing the uh, speaking at the time. Um, okay, so um, Andy, Phil, we're, we've we've got the boat set up. We're we're, we're not going to go into too much detail about you know the the getting to the base settings. Uh, of the boat, well, you know, we could talk for two hours on that. I dare say, but you know, let's let's assume we've we've got to the dinghy part for the day's racing. Um, we we know the forecast, um, and uh, we, we're we're thinking about how we're going to set the boat up uh, for that day's racing. Um, Andy, do you want to do you want to take us through your thoughts from 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 that particular moment, please? 
Um, yeah, well, I mean, the, the first thought is obviously the, in the morning of a, oh, I'm on an event, you, first thing you do is you wake up and you check the forecast, see what's going to happen for the day. Um, you know, see where it's going to be a building breeze or a dying breeze, um, or it's going to be light winds or heavy winds, really. Um, you know, and it's not only the boat, set, you know, how you set up the boat, but it's how you prepare yourself as well, ready for the you know, day sailing, you know. I always got told, to, I remember in my youth sailing, I got told by a coach once that, you know, there's two ways of approaching sailing. Well, not two ways, but there's two modes you can have, and it's like a boxer or a snooker, snooker player. You know, you can either be, um, you know, cool, calm and collected and, you know, it's going to be a light wind day. You want to be like a snooker player. You want to be cool and calm. You want to be thinking two or three thoughts ahead. You want to be, you know, relaxed into the day. Whereas if, you know, it's windy and, you know, 20 knots and big waves and going for it, you need to be revving yourself up and ready for, you know, preparing for the day and approaching it in that respect. Um, and also the same way in how you set up your boat. And, you know, if you know it's going to be light winds, you want to be setting up for you know, light wind, light wind day, um, you know, rig upright, you know, you know, more of a, a chilled out sort of setting, you know, keeping yourself calm. And, you know, same with, you know, if it's windy, looking to set your boat with a bit more tension on and, you know, maybe raking back a bit, you know, and look what's, look what's, how, what's going to go on through the day, really. Okay. So just, just thinking about that, um, rig up and, and rig rate uh well i mean what sort of stuff are we talking there like half holes sort of stuff oh yeah no more than half a hole i mean we generally have i mean we essentially have two settings you know an upright and rates back um it's very rarely we'll go rates back um unless we know it's going to be a really windy all day we generally go out on a more of an upright setting and then see what it's like out there yeah um so unless you know it's going to be windy you know, full on all day, then we'd probably think about knocking it back half a hole. Yeah. Um, but we generally wouldn't go any further than that. Yeah. So what's the, what's the point you, you go back one? Are we like four or five mode or more? Yeah, probably somewhere around there. I mean, it's when you're, you know, you're going to be fully, if you're spilling, you know, spilling wind all day, you're not being able to, you know, get the boom on the center. You're not, you know, you're constantly overpowered. That's when you're, you know, there's no point in fighting it. You might as well, yeah. you know, Relax into it, not relax into it, but you know, you know, don't fight it basically. Relax you, into you it. Go, if, you're, if you're overpowered, you're overpowered. You know, you, there's no point in trying to justify yourself there because you're bigger. You're not overpowered. You know. Do you ever adjust it's it on the water? Do you, do you ever adjust it on the water, Andy? Yeah. No, we do. Yeah, definitely. It's more. I would say if, in that respect, it's more for raking up. You know, being on the ball for going back up again when it drops, yeah. rather than you know dropping down a hole, you know, if it's generally, you know, you're going to be windy. It's when it's in between the modes and it suddenly, suddenly drops down a bit and you still, you don't want to, you've got to be switched on for thinking, oh, it's still a windy day, but it's, you know, it's dropped. So you can break back up again. Yeah. Um, you don't want to be setting your ways really. Yeah. I remember trying that once with Tim and um, I think we misjudged the waves at the time. I think we nearly lost the mast over the side. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's easy, easily done. <laughs> Right. Okay. So that's good. So uh, th thinking about tune there as well. So we've got chocks uh, in play. Um, do you want to talk us through your use of chocks for the different conditions? Uh, yeah, essentially we are generally have a chock in. Um, obviously in light winds, um, we generally take it out so we can get a bit of, you know, if we, you know, if we can bend the mast off a bit, um, mm -hmm. if we have, have a back chock, just flat, a flatter mainsail, uh, which helps in the very light stuff. But, you know, we've got different widths of chocks, but as, as a goal and rule of, th of a thumb, if, you know, if your boom's over the quarter for, you know, all your time sailing, you generally a good time to take a chock out. Um, there's a very basic sort of understanding of it. If, you know, if essentially, if you're overpowered, you know, you bend your ass off a bit. But yeah, if your boom's over the quarter constantly, you know, it's probably time that your chock's not in. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Cool. Uh, Phil, have you got anything to, to add uh, before we get onto the water, as it were? Um, similar sort of things to Andy. Um, well, we're, we're quite light, so we, we generally have to, have to really look at the forecast and work out how we're going to set the boat up for the day. Um, we're carrying probably a good 10 kilos less than quite a lot of other people that we're racing against in the fleet. Um, if it's going to be windy, I generally try and eat quite a bit in the morning. 
Um, <laughs> I, get, I get tired quite quickly. Deck a bottle of walking life jacket. Yeah, anything, <laughs> anything to get a bit of extra weight. I'm only, I'm, I'm, I'm just seventy, just over seventy kilos at the moment. So um, if I can get even an extra kilo every every little bit counts when it's quite windy. So um, yeah, so yeah, just. just and I know you, you obviously with Andy Smith, who's very technical minded, mm-hmm. and um, yeah. likes to be very, um, what's the right word? Picky with not picky is probably not the right word, but pedantic. Um, pedantic, yeah. So you probably, you know, you mess around with your rake and tensions quite yeah he's very very analytical in the way that he, he approaches things so we, we on the way to the dinghy park we'll have quite a quite an in-depth conversation about uh, what what the plan is for the day um what what we're what we're going to do in terms of setting the boat up um but we we take a lot uh, like a quite a complicated approach um we we work up to an event and we're constantly communicating days before about what the weather's doing and constantly looking at it and almost trying to map out what we're going to do in the event um, before we even get there. We're, um, we, we communicate a huge amount um, off uh, when we're not in the boat. So we only have to communicate about the things that are important when we are actually in the boat and on the water. So, yeah. I so the other thing with that is obviously just making sure that, you know, the helm and the crew are on the same wavelength. So, you know, discussing with them, you know, if you think it's going to get windy during the day, so you can, you know, discuss that obviously with your helm and then, you both know at say at two o'clock it's due to pick up. You can sort of be looking at well, it's half one now. Mm. You know, we should be watching out for this, and the race starts in you know twenty minutes. If it looks like it's coming in, is it worth thinking about? You know, if you have that thought process and you're both on the same page, it's easy mm. to discuss on the water rather than someone bring it up at half four that oh, it's going to get windy in ten minutes. That's um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a good point because. After a, a general recall or two, you, you lose track of time quite quickly because it, yeah. it's only on its timer. It's not really on mm-hmm. focusing on. No, the, you're not looking at the time at that point. You're just looking at seconds, aren't you? Yeah, exactly. So that's it's a good point to just have two and you're on the same page. And certainly, uh, I, I, I know we've we benefited and lost from knowing the time of day that we expected a big shift. You know, you, you could see the forecast was clocking big time at two o'clock and you're just being being um being ready for that and it's bailed us out of a, 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 a certain situation i remember at mounts bay uh, a few years ago of, of going hard left um and expecting this this forecast but it, it was just keeping an eye on the time that really helped cool all right so um so we're going to go out uh on uh, out, out to sea now and we'll keep it in the you know, we're obviously in a world's week this week, or we would have been. Um, so focusing on, um, you know, a, a, a world championship race and uh, gate starts and, you know, a good sized fleet. Um, so, um, Andy, we're, we're, we're going out on the water and um, you, you're normally out pretty early. Um, I assume that's to, to eyeball the first beat and all that good stuff. Do you want to do you want to take us through the thought process and communications that are going on in the boat at that point? Yeah, basically, it's like a maximum time on the water you can get, really. Um, get out there, see what's going on. Um, looking at the forecast is all good and well, but if you get out there and it's not quite the same, you need to be switched on to it. If you can see, you know, there'll be obviously certain local land effects or local wind, you know, variations that go on. Uh, if you can get out there, spot what's going on, spot, you know, if the wind's oscillating, you know, if it's going, you know, five or ten degrees one way every sort of five or ten minutes, something like you can which will also then benefit you on the gate start. So you can say, oh, we're in a left-hand shift. We need to be, you know, starting early or late or such, you know, have that all set up. You know, if you can get into the groove as soon as you can. So you can, you know, when you, when you pull your sails in, go around the gate, boy, you can instantly know what number you're on and mm. know whether that's a good or a bad thing. Yeah. Really. So you, have you got, uh, you got a tactic on board then for that? Yeah. 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 Okay. And you time you so you're going out on the first beat, and what you're, you're trying to time time the oscillations. No, I mean not necessarily time it, just looking at numbers. Sort of, yeah. it's very hard to sort of judge the timings, and they never, you know, you never guaranteed it's going to be five minutes, and that you just yeah. you just should get into a groove of it. You know, if you you know what the low numbers are, you'll know what the high numbers are. Mm-hmm. So you know, if it's two minutes to go for the gate start, you can pull your sails in, do a thirty second upwind to see what your numbers are, and know. Yeah which shift you're in and you, you can obviously use your eyes as well, look out of the boat, see what's going on. Okay. Um, but if you've been out there for longer, you'll be used to, you know, you're used to what's going to be happening. You're looking for it, you know, you're yeah. not trying to figure out what's going on. You're trying to figure out, you're trying to 
you know you should know what's going to be coming down yeah. okay so i'm glad you said you don't sign it because i've i've read a number of books about this and it's saying you, you read the olympic standard books it's a yeah you can, you can set your clock by it almost and i think i've never managed to pull that off so no 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 <laughs> glad you haven't as well <laughs> I say it's more. I think it's more of a visual thing. You probably see, you know, if you look up, up wind, you can sort of see, you know, which way the the wind's tracking down the course. And you know, mm -hmm. if you've been out there a long time, you know, you've done sort of a full beat and then a couple of half beats. If you know, if possible, you sort of get into the groove of, you know, what 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 the course is looking like and what you know you're expecting expecting to happen. And you know, I said a good point of practice beats and say, oh, I think it's going to head now looking at what's going on and you go into it and it doesn't head, you think, well, you know, I'm glad it's in the race. So I'm glad it's, you know, it's the sort of thing where you get used to looking at these things. Yeah. Um, just, you know, helps keep you, you know, sharp and in sync with what's going on. And it's yeah. the, the other thing, you know, it, if you look at the forecast and you know it's going to be tracking all day and, you know, you've been out there an hour before the start and you see it is slowly doing that, you can, you know, you, you know that's happening if you get out of there terrence for the start you go oh, this isn't the wind direction i thought it was going to be or oh, this isn't you know you don't know what's going on really so if you if you've posted a forecast pre and you've been out there for an hour before you know seeing what's going on yeah you, you know you're in sync with what's happening really yeah so so how does that work in your boat there you're obviously you know darn handy helm as well um which i am nowhere near um and um you and you and Ian uh, probably got a language established o over the years. Are, are you just sort of t talking about what you both can see? Is is one of you leading it? What? How, how yeah, I mean, I as a crew, I always find you know you don't want two helms in a boat. You know, mm -hmm. it's the worst thing you can have. You know, yeah, I always, you know it's you know person with a stick makes a decision at the end of the day. Yeah. All you can do is feed him with as much information as you can. Yeah. Um, and I say if yeah. It's the same with sorry, tactics or win. You know, if you're, if, if you know, the helm says to you, should we tack? And you look at it and you're going on, probably by the time you've tacked, it's too late and you missed what's what you were looking at tacking for. So you just need, essentially, as a crew, you sort of need to be feeding the information in and letting mm -hmm. the helm, you know, ultimately he has the final say. So as long as he's got all the information in his power and you trust what he's going to do, you know, you, you go with it, really. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So Phil, based on the comments you made earlier, I'm expecting um, Andy's got a laptop out there and he's G GPS <laughs> tracking all this stuff and um, all the rest of it. How, how's it working your but This in mind, this is pre-start and we're just sort of yeah. out there early. And, and um, well, pre-start, first thing we do is we do a full systems check, so we make sure that everything is working as it should. Um, we know it is going to, but we always do a full systems check. Just if, if anything's going to go wrong, you want it to go wrong before you get out there. Yeah. Um, before you get out to the start so on the way out we'll check everything um every system on board kick a kite down all everything you can think of on the boat we'll make sure it's working mm. um and then we'll do the same as in nandy we'll we'll head up the first beat um try and get some some idea of what the what the wind's doing and how it's fluctuating um i don't know about Ian and andy but what we do in our boat is we we write numbers down so we've actually got numbers written down on the deck um, and then if there's any significant change, um, you know, more than five degrees, um, sometimes, you know, it doesn't even have to be that. If, it, if we notice it's a constant change, we'll, we'll write that down. Um, but yeah, um, it's the same thing that Andy was saying. It's all about feeding information back to the helm. So mm -hmm. I paint um, Andy the best picture I possibly can. I tell him what I can see and all the information I think is relevant because it doesn't matter what he can see. It's not relevant to me, but um you know what i can see helps him understand what's happening especially behind the jib you know is it's such a big jib on those boats it's such a big blind spot for the helms um anything you can tell them about what's happening over there you can see it before they can so passing it back um in in as simple a way as possible so we we try to keep the communication direct to the point um you know comes across sometimes slightly rude but it, you know <laughs> As Andy was saying, you know, if, if, if you're talking about something, by the time you've talked about it, it's happened, it's been, it's gone, it's not relevant anymore. So you just need to be able to pass it and deal with it immediately. So, yeah. yeah. Okay, we'll, co we'll come back to that a little more, actually, uh, when we get up, up the first beat. All right, thanks, Phil. Um, so we've, we've prepared the start. So I, th I think the main message to, 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 to listeners here is, is preparation. And I'm always fascinated by... The, the lateness that some people are getting to the racetrack 
yeah. I, I don't mean that, you know, in a, a derogatory way, but it's, you know, I know people come for more for the, the, the fun side of it, but we're all there for a, for, for a race as well. And, um, but when it, when you see some people just, I know issues might have occurred, but if people are just arriving like a couple of minutes before the uh, gun goes, um, you've, you've missed a shed load of information. Um, so, you know, if you're trying to improve, which is, is, is what I, I guess the reason that you're on, on this, uh, on this call now is, um, getting out there early, checking, um, checking as Phil says, the boat works, um, getting your spinnaker and your spinnaker pole on the right side for the first hoist. Um, and, uh, and getting that information, you know, look, looking at the racetrack, you know, I know we sail at sea a lot, um, but, um, over the course of the week, you will almost certainly be experiencing, um, you know, an inland effect for, as a result of a, an offshore breeze. And, um, you know, you can get, you get the funnels coming, you know, so especially on the South coast where you've got the, the, you know, the, the harbor towns that we sail at, at Lou and, uh, other places and, uh, Brixham, uh, being another one. And, um, you get the funnel effect in the valleys and the closer you get to those, um, you know, where, where they plonk the, the windward mark, uh, cause the, the lure is so far out to sea, um, getting that early insight into how that affects the, the top mark race, um, is, is really quite key. And, uh, you know, you're only going to find that out by, uh, being, being out there early and, and, and sussing it out. And you, you've got to do it pretty much every day as well. It's, it's unusual for us to get the same direction every single day. So it's the same yeah. direction, also the same tide state as well. Yes, so exactly. That has a big effect, especially you know in places like Lou, mm. uh, when you've got the little island that sticks out, obviously affects it and things like that. Yeah. You know, it's, it does have a big effect on your decision making for the top half of the beat. Yeah, yeah. Great. Okay. Um, everybody okay with this so far? Any any questions? Anybody wants to chip in? Right, I'll take that as everybody's happy. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Okay. I'm going to, um, I'm going to share my screen now. Um, the, the guys at Lou, um, uh, filmed, uh, I think every single race, uh, from the nationals that we did, uh, there back in 2007. Um, and they've got some absolutely belting footage of, uh, uh, some, some stuff that we want to go through this evening. And, um, we're going to have to improvise along the way because we don't have, you know, sort of Ian and Andy and, 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 the, and the fleet, you know, uh, doing the full beat. But we get a sense of the race and uh, we, we, we see some, uh, the, the whole of the start. And uh, we also see some really good footage of uh, some of the reaches. Um, so I'm going to sort of duck and dive into this, uh, this video and um, we'll, we'll talk through it and we'll, we'll ask the guys what the sort of thinking was at, uh, at the time. So let me just uh, share my screen. <coughs> Maybe one second. Uh, <clears throat> okay, has that come through? Yep. Yeah. Okay, right. So I'm just going to go back up this. Okay, so this is uh, right at the beginning of the race and um, at the start, uh, obviously. Um, thank oh, God. There we actually, go. We're second out. Well, you're second out, right? That's interesting. Okay, we'll come on to that in a sec. Um, I, I think Andy and Ian are ab about probably 10 seconds further on. So, oh, yeah. That there. Yeah, that's you there. So you're sort of holding up and holding up and holding up, and then you're probably just going to release it at the last minute. So I'll just play this through, and then we'll talk through it. Okay, so boom. Just ducking the... Um, the gate boat, obviously. Okay, so what's, I don't know if you remember this far back, but you've, you've obviously gone for early starts here, and I don't know if that's your normal um, MO, or is it, uh, were, were the circumstances on the day that, uh, that determined that? Andy, do you, do you want to start? Uh, we gen unless there's a big um, wind read, or like a big shift to start late, we would generally tend to start in the first third. Mm -hmm. um, where two areas is we generally tend to back our boat speed um, and also once you're you know once you're out of the gate all your options are open if something happens you can react to it if you're if you start late 
um, which sometimes is the right thing to do. But if you start late and something happens, then you literally you can't you can't do anything to to, to change it really. Yeah. Um, I would say you know it's obviously all depends on the wind conditions and what's going on. But generally, we tend to start in sort of the first third. Yeah. Um, and also the other the other reason is. But one of the other reasons is if you get a lot of boats punching up high and your sort of tucks in, you they can have more effects on you know messing up your start as well. Yeah, yeah. Phil. Uh, yeah, same. We we generally start um, historically. We've started very early. We're normally one of the first ten boats out. Um, sometimes Andy will make it his mission to be the first boat out. Um, you, you just get out, you've got, you've got no boats around you generally. Uh, a lot of people tend to start to middle the line. So if you start early, you've normally got a bit more space to move around. We like being in, in, in our control of our own race. You know, we control our own destiny then. Um, as Andy said, once you're out, all the options are available to you. You're not sat there waiting to start. You can just get on with it. Um, we, we like to think we've got good boat speed at wind as well. So um, especially if you work the boat hard, you can, you can make it to your advantage, um, getting out early and, and getting some distance on people. So, um, yeah. we, okay. we generally start, start quite early. Um, the, the only time we've started late was, was at Mounts Bay. Um, and it was only in, uh, two or three of the races. Um, and that was just because it was, it was very evident that it was preferable to start late. So. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think I remember one of those where I think, I think it was saying the gas at the time, and um, I think we're lying in about 11th place, and um, we absolutely bust a gut to get to 10 so we could be Pathfinder, so we could take the right side of the course. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> on the other hand, certainly with Tim, he likes to start late so he doesn't have to race for longer. But yeah, then I'll tag out for a while. <laughs> <laughs> well, as you say, so, you know, if you don't feel as confident in your speed and things like that, you know, it's essentially. As someone always told me as a, as a kid doing gate stats in toppers, you know, if you start late, you're going to have to beat and you're in 10th place. Yeah. Um, it's not necessarily true, but it's um, one way people look at it. There's yeah. still people that start late. I know um, one, of the, one of the guys, Monkey, um, he always starts fairly late and is always popping in around the top 10, the windward mark, if not better. So starting early doesn't mean that you're always going to be in the top 10 and starting late doesn't mean you're always going to get pushed out of the top 10. It's, it's, yeah. it's all about what you, what you make of your first beat. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But I think, as you say, if, if I think the, the test is, am I faster or slower than the pathfinder? If faster go earlier. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's the like... reason uh, to, 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 to need to go late because right side pays. Uh, but even saying that you could still start early and go over right pretty quick. If you've, if you've managed to pop it quick, um, yeah, as I say, generally uh, you judge it on what the wind's been, you know, what phase of the, you know, wind you're in, what shift's going on, um, and other boats as well. Other boats obviously a factor. Yeah. Um, you know, if there's a big bunch bunching up early, you know, you might just let them all crack on with each other and start mm -hmm. ten boats above them or something like that. Yeah, I'm um, sure Ian and Andy have done the same, which is you might start early, but it actually you want to get as far across, so you might end up tacking early and just taking the hit, ducking and diving through a few boats popping a few tacks in here and there to get yourself to the other side of the racetrack. Um, so you can make the advantage. If there's a shift that, that comes in, you know, just before you start and you commit to start early, there's still no reason why you can't get across. You've just got to be a bit, bit creative. Yeah, no, we've done it, done it plenty of times. You start early and in the first, you know, 10 seconds out of the gate, you realize you're not in the right place and you just, you know, do all you can to get across the other side. Yeah. You know, it's better, getting away that side and dropping 20 boats and being the wrong way and dropping 60 boats. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, okay. So, yeah, no, it's all, you know, say it's just keeping your head out of the boat and seeing what's, seeing what's going on. Yeah. Okay. So we popped out behind the, uh, the gate boat and it's, it's hiking till it hurts at this point. Cause th this is key now, isn't it? We're, we're in the sort of first, yeah, first gate starts the first, you know, 30 seconds to a minute, yeah. you know, other than trying to keep an eye on what's going on with the wind, the boat above you and the boat below you are the two most important boats in the fleet. Yeah. You've got to, you've got to hold your lane, not pop out. Hmm. Um, otherwise you're, you know, you're ducking a lot of transoms. Yeah. Okay. So talk us through it then, you know, you've, you've, you've popped out behind the, the gate, but you're sitting out as hard as you can. What, what's going on in the boat in terms of 
right, am I going to hold this tack or am I going to tack? Well, you know, what, what are you doing as a crew to inform this, this situation now? Um, I mean, you know, also, you know, obviously you watch what's going on before you get out of the gate. Uh, you're seeing what's, you know, trying to keep an eye on, you know, you can see what the gate boat is doing, whether he's looking high or low. You know, you generally come out there, you know, pre-start, you generally beat, have a beat on the gate boat line so you can get an idea of what number that is and mm. get a judge on what they're doing. Um, and then coming out of the gate, it's, you know, fairly early on, you know, say, the first 30 seconds to a minute, you're just, all, everything's boat speed. You just got to get that boat driving, um, you know, get the foils gripping as soon as you can and everything, you know, fast forward and get the boat moving. Um, you know, as, as soon as you've got your lane, you're looking good. You're just looking around, seeing what's going on then. Is the boat, is the fleet lifting inside? Are, they, are you come up above them? Um, mm. You know, if you if you worked well, you were at a point where if you wanted to, you can tack across and not duck anyone. Um, just you know, seeing you know what's going on with the fleet. Then mm. um, it's not like it's you know a conventional start where you you know you generally pop out and you've got sixty percent of the fleet below behind you. They've messed up the start. Generally, you know, you're all there's a long line of boats that are all playing with each other, and it's just seeing you know how you're looking compared to all of those. Really, yeah. Okay. What, what what's going on in terms of? You know, I, I, I know the answer to this because uh, I've seen I've seen you do it. But you and Ian get a, a really good rhythm going in terms of uh, you know you know rolling with the waves. Uh, you know, yeah. wait, back, wait forward. Um, you know, talk us through that. I always just all you know say you just in you know you in that you coming out of the gate. It's all about speed. You know, you're not mm. generally you know you don't you have your eye on what's going on, but. You know, you you want to be working together. You communicate when there's a wave coming, coming on gusts. Mm. You know, yeah, your shoulders are out. You you know, you you got to wait far out as you can, mm. and you just just trying to drive the boat. You know, every every single ounce of speed that there is there, you gotta you gotta get it moving. Yeah. Um, and that comes from you know, come, you know, lining up with pre-start. You know, if you're if you're reaching down to get towards the gate, but as soon as you you do a you know a handbrake turn on the bottom of it, you've just stopped. So yeah. Uh, yeah, you'll get your lining up early and then coming out and just communicating, you know, talking when the waves are coming so you can, you know, bounce over them and, you know, keep, keep the boat flat, kick yeah. is on, you know, all the sails are set up right and it's just all yeah. fast forward, basically. Yeah. So, uh, so kicker, you, are, you, are you controlling the kicker or is he? Yeah. yeah. So generally kicker, Cunningham, um, I would do with those situations, essentially, you know, Helm's got a chill in one hand and the main sheet in the other. Mm. And you know you've basically got two free hands, so you should be, other than you know hiking out, yo yo, you've got the main control of everything really. Yeah. Um, you know you've got essentially the eyes and the ears because you're looking round, whereas the helm's you know staring at telltales all day. Yeah. Um, so you've just got to you know be feeding information in, but controlling the speed of the boat at the same time as well. Okay, so I think that's an important point, and it's 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 not something that I picked up until perhaps more later i think um when i was sailing with tim he 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 knew he could feel the boat uh, and on on the sea i think kickers not adjusted quite as much so he he was doing that more and yeah. then um coming in land and and sailing with with gaz it it, it helped so much more that i was doing the kicker and, and as you say it's for the reason of helm's got enough going on and so, you know, with that free hand and, and learning how to set the kicker correctly, the, that, that really became the crew's job. And, and Gary, Gaz calls it like the auto kicker in our, our boat now. Uh, he doesn't... Yeah, it's, it's not, you know, you, as a, I know the helm can feel it a lot easier because they've got the tiller and a main sheet, but you mm. should get able to get a feel of, you know, when you've got too much kicker on. Yeah. You, know, you can sort of feel the boat feels, starts to feel sticky and, you know, it's, mm. you know, it's a bit of a lag and you should just... Yeah. Even just like as you go into it, I always find if it's a marginal day where you're, you know, in and out of the boat quite a lot, it's always good. I always go in and put my hand on the kicker to, you know, to let it off. Because if you're going in, generally because there's less pressure and yeah, you, know, you don't need a kicker on. So it's always good just to have your hand free next to it, ready to do something. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Phil, so how's it going in your boat? You've just popped off the start line. What, what, how are you getting that boat as fast um, as you Yeah. I'm trying to, trying to, 
get over the start line as quick as possible. As you say, if you're doing a handbrake turn, it's never good. So we generally, um, in Andy's words, uh, Andy Smith's words, hit the guard boat. We generally aim to hit the engine because mm. normally there's a slight weight comes off the back of the boat. So just as you hit the back of it, it just gen generally pushes the bow off a couple of feet. So if you can aim for the engine, the chance of you hitting it's quite remote. So um, we, we go full speed. Um, and then it's holding your lane. Um, it, it really is a bit of a drag race for the first 30 seconds um with the with the boats above and below you so we we try really really hard to keep our lane <clears throat> we're quite light again so if it's windy it's it is a bit harder for us to hold our lane so sometimes we might switch into a slightly higher slightly slower mode um which which might not sound normal to some people um but it means we're less likely to, to lose our height um and let the boat Above us um, generally comes down over the bow, gets over our jib, and then uh, we get pushed out the back. So we work quite hard to keep quite a high line for the first 30 seconds. Um, and then I'll generally crack off, go slightly bow down, and then get a bit of speed out of the boat. But we, we really fight the first 30 seconds for our lane because um, because being light, it's very, very easy to get pushed out the back very, very quickly. Um, we work the boat very, very hard in the first 30 seconds. It's probably the, the hardest we work the boat in the, the whole race is that first. Yeah of 30 seconds to a minute mm -hmm. um you know as a crew playing the kicker um getting every ounce of speed out of the boat um and, and andy will just just focus on holding that lane um and it's it's just a case of if you if you if, if you if you hike in hike harder you know it's, it's all you can do is just get get as much weight back out of the boat as possible um andy has a tendency that if i'm not hiking hard enough he'll just shout heads because if i'm not hiking hard enough my head's in the way of his telltales so I'll just constantly for the first minute just get head, 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 and it just means I'm not working hard enough. And it yeah. just reminds me that I need to hike harder. So Yeah. Okay. Right. Well, okay. So we've we've sort of popped out now. We've we're 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 coming up to sort of thinking about first tack and um and and the beat generally, I guess. Um so Andy, what you know, we're going up the first beat now. What's what's the, the what's the thought process? What what communication's going on in the boat now? Um, well, say so you, you, you know, you're looking at what you've discussed pre-start, um, you know, you might think that, you know, we want to start early, but we want to, we want to be getting, you know, out right as soon as possible. So if you're doing that, you, you're looking for a, you know, you're looking for a lane to tack and you're looking for a spot where you can cross, you know, a couple of boats and have a bit of clear air. Mm -hmm. Um, or if you're vice versa, if you think it's going to be a, a drag race out to the, to the left hand side, then you're then setting up, setting up for that. Um, we're always, you know, I, essentially you're always looking for relatives around you. You're always wanting to know whether you're high or low compared to, because generally, uh, you are, sometimes you're really able to, generally there's like a big bulk of boats high, either above you or below you. Um, and you're generally just trying to get relatives off them so you can see, you know, in the short term, are you, you know, high, are you low, are you slow, are you fast? Um, and you're just constantly discussing, you know, essentially that all the way around. and if you both know, you both know what the game plan is, you both know you're trying to get out right, and, you know, essentially I see a gap and I say, all right, we can tie, we're clear, you know, we can cross those boats and we've got a gap and there's a lane, you know, it's, he'll check it and, you know, we can go, but if you're only both in the same sink of what you're trying to get, what, what your objective is, yeah. um, it's quite, you know, you just sort of constantly, you know, communicating and discussing that really. Okay. So you're, you're the eyes of the boat here, or is Ian looking yeah, I mean, obviously, you know, he's looking around as well, but, you know, you've got a lot more time in your hands. Um, in fact, you, you know, you're, you're not steering the boat, so you can, you can see the slightly bigger picture of what's going on and give that back to him, and he can have the, you know, the boat-on-boat -boat manoeuvres yeah. and, the, you know, the, the short terms of what's, what's mm -hmm. happening. You know, say we want to get right, and there's, but it's a very shifted day, and it might be like, you know, he can see something close that's happening, and I can say generally, you know, the game plan's still looking good, you know, what's, what's happening. Mm -hmm. You can pick out a couple of shifts to get there. Um, but I say you're just generally feeding the information into him, saying it's still looking good what we discussed, or, you know, it's, it's changed a bit. There's yeah. a, you know, we can't get across what else is going on. Yeah. So. It's getting a bit tricky at times. I mean, if you're starting first third, or, or in Phil's case, second boat, and it, as, long, as long as he's not hit, taking the engine off the uh, <laughs> gate boat, um you, you know you, you're starting early you you know 100 plus fleet uh there's a, there's a there's a there's a big old distance to be looking back up the the, the fleet yeah. there and judging that is sometimes pretty tricky isn't it 
It is, yeah. No, no, it's and say there's there's you know, there's big amounts to be lost and gained. Um, you know, a ten degree shift on the start of a gate boat can be a hundred boats. Um but say you, 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 if you've been out early, you'd be knowing generally that's not going to happen. All that is going to happen, and we'll be on the right side for it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's essentially it comes down to what your your tactics are and just sort of sticking to them or mm. adapting them to what else is going on. Okay. Okay. Cool. I say it can be quite. You know, if you've been out, it's, again, it comes down to being out there early. Mm. If you if you've been out there early and you you know you know the winds. You know, down a bit in a minute, but the can see it's going to come back in you know two minutes time or something like that. And there's you know sixty boats that all look like yeah they've gone totally you know over the top of you, but you 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 know in your head you know you're confident it's going to come back. You don't have to worry. Whereas if you hadn't been out pre-start, you wouldn't know that, and you'd be panicking and tacking off to quit your losses. Yeah, um, it's sort of backing what you know and what you've learned that morning or that afternoons. Yeah. Okay. So, Phil, what's going on in your boat in terms of, you know, beat strategy and uh, comms? And... Um, same, same thought. I think we've normally mapped the beat out before, um, before we start the race. So we've got an idea of where we want to go. Just sometimes you can't go where you want, but you, as long as you've got an idea, <clears throat> you'll start heading the right way. Uh, I generally just feed Andy as much information as possible. Um, if I think there's an opening um, where we want to tack across, I'll, I'll pass that back. Um, g- generally, if... If we're struggling, for some reason we've had to, to tack out early because we, you know, we've been rolled and we're trying to find a new lane. I'll generally have a lot of control on and when we tack and what the slots are because mm. I, I've got time to look and think. Whereas Andy's just trying to keep the boat going fast. But once we get a bit further at the beat and a bit more space, um, mm. I'll pass in the information and, and really he's on the stick, so it's his decision whether we're going to tack or not. But we're, we're very in sync. We've been sailing together for such a long time now. It's it's. Mm we don't have to communicate about it too much it's i'll pass the information and just by feel of the boat i can tell if we're, we're on for attack or not so it's it's all just about communicating and keeping your head out and think thinking about what everybody else is doing um not not just looking in front of you looking at uh, you know everything that's going on the race course as much as you can see really um so you're not missing anything substantial okay cool and just just thinking about you know that the the beat and uh, different conditions um Obviously, we've set this up. We've, we've, we've seen that gate start that, uh, in the video there, and uh, we, our minds instantly turn to, you know, busting a gut on the height. But um, how, how, how are we adjusting the boats uh, for, for different conditions uh, then? Thinking about things like kick, uh, chalk, uh, jib tension? Yeah, again, it's, you know, essentially that first, you know, up the beat, you know, we talk about, say, coming out of the gate, it's all about hiking hard and going fast and that side of things. But obviously, if it's light winds, it's not about hiking hard. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, you, if it's light winds, you've got to be working the boat over the waves. You know, you've got to be making sure you're not overshooting the jib. Um, you know, not too much tension. And and say, the, the, you know, it's important in windy weather as well, but, you know, a huge part in light winds is head out of the boat. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a lot easier to spot shifts in light wind than it is in heavy wind. You can, you, can, you know, there are you know, dark water's clearer to spot then, really. Um, I mean, it's not always the case, but, you know, generally, you know, it's head out of the boat, see what's going on. Yeah. Um, you know, there's m- much bigger gains to be gained um, in light winds than heavy wind, because, you know, in heavy winds, it's, you know, difference between, you know, 12 and 13 knots. In mm. windy weather, it's different. In light winds, it's different between, you know, three and ten knots you know <laughs> no they're not ten but you know it's it's that sort of difference that yeah. you know is beneficial to it and it's generally the lighter days when it flicks around more as well mm. so that's when you've you know you say it's just head out the boat feeding information so you know you, you can add to your game plan and add to your add to your what you, you know your, your plan is to get up, up the beat yeah so just just for those that aren't as familiar with this and forgive me if you, if you know him but the Jib tension uh, in the lighter stuff, uh, absolutely crucial. And I think the guide for me, and Andy and Phil, correct me, um, is, you know, it, it, where you're hiking out, jib's in pretty tight. Um, but that, that moment where the crew starts to ease in and then starts going onto the bench, uh, the slot uh, that the jib makes, um, 
uh, that there's not enough wind to push the jib open and you'll find that the jib starts folding on the shroud. Yeah, it's amazing it's how many boats you see sailing around with the, you know, the, the shroud, the, the jib pinned in against the shroud. That's it. So um, in, the, in the light stuff, I'd say I'd be looking up there. You know, if I'm in the boat, I'd be looking up every, you know, 30 seconds. Yeah. See what's going on. Yeah. Um, just constantly. Yeah, I'm the same. I'm, I'm always... What's going on, looking up. What's going on, looking up sort of thing. And, okay. So, and so that's... Used to it. You get used to how it should look. Say again, yeah. sir. You get used to how it should look. You get used to how the boat feels when the slot's right and you, you're looking up and checking it and, and feeling the boat itself. It's, it, you know, you, you, get, you get an idea of, of whether it's right or not. Yeah. And, and so, you know, for, for those not as familiar with this, if you, if you take one thing from tonight as crews, it's that jib tension on, on, on the beat, I would say. Uh, that, that point where you, you're coming in, as I say, um, kick us off and... You've, you've got to keep that slot open, uh, especially inland 100%, but especially on the sea as well, because you need that softness in the sail to get you over the waves and any chop. Um, so just making sure, and we're not talking about massive movement necessarily, it's, it's just almost millimetres of uh, uh, adjustment. Just to keep I find a lot of the time is if you um, take the jib out of the cleat and put it back in again without moving it, that that closing of the cam is enough to give you, you know, 10 mil of, 10 mil, the leech 10 mil at the top. Yeah. yeah or sometimes, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's a little amount, but it makes a huge difference. It does. It does. So that, that's number one uh, for, for me of, of, of lighter air stuff is, is making sure you've got that slot right. And as crews, that's 100% in your control. Um, and, and, and you will find your lighter air speed uh, improving significantly if you just take that one, one thing from tonight. Okay, so we're getting up um, to the beat. I'm conscious of time. <laughs> it's nearly 20 past eight. We've not even got to the top mark yet, but so we'll, we'll, we'll go at a pace now. Um, so um, we're getting up to the top mark, and uh, it, it could be carnage if you if you're down the fleet. I wouldn't have carnage, perhaps a strong word, but you might have a bit of a battle getting around the, the top mark. And we discussed uh, quite a bit of this on the Helms talk last night, so I don't want to repeat too much of that. But thinking about coming up to the top mark, um, guys, uh, what what's 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 the sort of communications going on? What what's the sort of preparation for for getting ready on that kite hoist? Um, for for me, you know, the the boat on boat, other than you know helping the helm find a gap. You know, if you've had a gap, the, the boat on boat stuff is obviously down to the helm. He's, you know, he's uh, he's got the feel for it. You know, he, you know, he's got the stick in his hand, so you just go what to say. But so the top third of the beat, you're always if it's a reach, you know, you're always looking for where the reach mark is. A lot of times, you know, I remember a few times where you struggle to find it and you not know whether it's high or low or you know, if it's too tight for the kite and things like that. So it's always it's always good to spot that. You know, it's sometimes hard to see and it sounds a bit silly, but you know, knowing where the marks are is a, a big, big thing. Um, and if he's gone onto a run, we all, you know, it's always a, you don't want to get to the mark and have to be figuring out whether it's a, you know, a hoist or a jibe. Mm -hmm. you, know, you want to know, you know, 20 ball lengths away, you know, hoist yeah. or, you know, is it straight hoist or jibe hoist? Yeah. Um, and it's, it's just that, out. you don't want that communication as you go around, around the mark, really. Yeah. Just keep going, guys. I'm, I'm just going to wind this on now to top mark. Uh, yeah, I agree with what Andy's saying. It's, it's all about yeah. preparation, knowing, knowing what you're going to do. Um, if we're coming in um, on, on a starboard lay and I've got time to get the pole on before we get to the one with Mark, then I'll clip it on four or five boat lens ahead because it just saves you that couple of seconds, which means you get the kite up a couple of seconds earlier than somebody else and then you pull out a couple of boat lengths. It's all about mm. getting that kite up and set as quick as possible and the boat pointing in the right direction. Okay. Um, to capitalize on that. Yeah. So I mean, one of the things that was mentioned last night was, you know, if, if you are rending slightly late, and I, and I know that I, Tim and I have done this a number of times, and you're a bit down the pack, it's, it, it maybe not necessarily go for the kite straight away and maybe just fetch it out slightly uh, just to give yourself a higher lane to come down. Yeah. Um, just having, having that communication within the boat about if, you know, if you, if you are not in the top, one, two, three, four, five, or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. We, we sometimes will try and go, go low um, on, the, on the first reach mark. Um, yeah. being, being light, we use that to our advantage. A lot of the fleet will push each other high, so we'll actually go low and then 
um, sort of halfway along, start getting our height back and then come in with a bit more speed because everybody's generally coming down on more of a broad reach. Yeah. Sometimes if they've gone so high, they're, they're virtually coming down on a run sometimes. Yes. Um, so coming into that mark quick means uh, means you can you can get quite a few places from doing yeah. that. So as, as light wind crews, you know, we sometimes use that to our advantage. Yeah. And then if it really is windy um, and we're sort of maybe... 10th to the windward mark and we can see that everybody's already struggling you know if, you know the heavier guys are struggling with their kites there's no point us putting it up we can work the boat just as fast with two sails as some people can with three okay. um and we'll again we'll just point for the can <clears throat> everybody will be going high and we can take advantage of that and then when yeah. it's when it's sensible then we can put the kites up so there's, there's not always a pressure to get it up straight away yeah okay so thinking about setting the boat up for the for the um, for the reach. Um, so we're, we're getting kicker off at the, at the pretty much at the mark. Yeah, as you go around, yeah. handful of kicker off. Yeah, um, cutting them off. Um, I tend not to uh, let the dip up too much to stop the head catching when the kite's coming up. Yeah. Yeah, and I say you know you you prep you know your twinners are on you. Mm -hmm. Your poles are ready to go. Um, you know, it's just everything's set so that when you hoist, it's not you're not stood in the middle of the boat undoing cleats, pulling stuff in. You know, and 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 now's a good time to not find out that you've got the kite still in the windward bag when. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, all the way out before the race to get it in the right bag on the pole on the right side. Yeah, yeah. And in the lighter airs, it's all about you know not unsettling the boat. Um, about you know, yeah, keeping it smooth. Moving, getting, it, getting it up quickly, but as smooth as possible. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I think, especially because you, you sort of get into a pattern on the sea, don't you? So you, you, it's almost like your body's in an upwind wave pattern and then, and then suddenly you're turning and you're standing up and it's like, oh, hang on. So um, just, just adjusting, to, like you say, just get the thing settled a bit sometimes rather than diving at it like you're at an inland event when the, when the water's flat. Just, just to help smooth things out a little bit, and the boat's not bouncing about all over the shop. Okay, so um, I, I, we, unfortunately, it didn't show us the top mark in in, in this. So we, we've we've come down the first reach. So they, we've got Fergus uh, leading this race now, and then I think it's Mike, and then yourself, uh, Andy. Um, so at the, we've come up to the jibe mark here. Um, Talk us through the jibe just just quickly, Andy. Uh, well, obviously approaching the jibe, you know, I'd imagine probably might have been slightly before that, but I'm going in there probably setting the lewd twinner, um, getting ready to, you know, the jib off and essentially going into the jibe. So everything, again, everything's set for coming out the other side. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you generally have a... We generally have a call that sort of says, you know, I prep or prepare for the jibe or, you know, something mm -hmm. like that where you know, it's set up, we'd go in, you know, I'd get ready, so twinning would be on, I'd ease the gym a little bit, I'd pre-sheet, the wind would sheet a little bit, so it's handy for someone to get a hold of. Yeah. Um, and yeah, just basically make it so it's a, a case of, when we get to the mark, it's a case of just steering through it and chucking the pole over, really. Yeah, yeah. And do, does it vary by wind strength, would you say? Yeah, I mean, we have different, obviously, you just do things at a later stage of, you know, lighter stuff. Um, you know, we'd get, if it's really windy, we'd have, you know, a few different, um, you know, maybe it wouldn't be as hard corners, you know, you wouldn't come out as high. Mm. Or, you'd, you know, you generally, you know, if it's lighter, you'd pass all the sheets back to Ian so he could fly the kite through the jibe where it's windy, you'd just sort of get it round so it's behind the main again so you can get the pole out quicker. Yeah. Um, and same again, you know, if you if you've got a bit of space and you're on a wave, you know, you, or there's a wave coming, you can tell that wave through the jibe with you rather than you know jibing on top, you know, in a wave or you know on top of a wave. So you you know you're slowing right down again. You know, if you can get a wave into the jibe, so you've got speed going into it. There's less load in the main, there's less load in the spinnaker, and it yeah. just makes life a bit easier. Yeah. So my, my first wor uh, Worlds I ever did was at uh, Hoth back in 88. And um, one of the guys, it was absolutely blowing its what's its off for the, for the first day. And the, the comment in the bar was, uh, why do they always put that jibe mark in the middle of all those capsized boats? <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, pretty, pretty, I think that's one of the key things you've mentioned there, Andy, is um, I always liken it to skiing, really. And uh, if, you ever, if, it, if you've ever skied, it's the only way you're going to get down a, a big slope is by going for it. Yeah. It's the same with, uh, um, with sailing, I find, is the moment you start slowing down and you're getting all a bit twitchy about it and the kite's flapping and then you've not got the wave right, it, the load on the sails becomes immense. Yeah. And actually, the faster you can go, uh, and if you can catch a wave and be accelerating down that, and even get in the shadow, shadow of it, if it's a big, really big wave, um, the jibe's uh, uh, so, so much easier. And I realize that's easier said than done, especially in a big sea. But um, po positivity wins the day, usually, on those. Yeah, it's, a, it's a, a never hesitate scenario, isn't it? It's a <laughs> you drive, drive, with, you drive the good outcome, yeah. not the bad outcome. You know, you've got you to gotta go into it thinking, I'm going to get two bolts around this mark rather than, oh, I'll put up capsize. Yeah. Uh, go for it, sort of. Yeah. As soon as you hesitate, that's when, you know, the boat comes unbalanced and everything starts yeah. going a bit wrong. If you're, if you're going for it, go for it. Don't, yeah. you know. Yeah. Don't so that, think that's about going for it the, and then worry yeah. what's going to happen. Yeah, the helm on the waggling stick bailing out halfway through it is a little yeah. bit... <laughs> <laughs> Worst case is you'll capsize, but at least you'll be pointing in the right direction. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. All right. So, invariably, there's different tightness to the two reaches. Uh, yeah. What one's broader, usually. Usually, the, Generally the top reach is tighter, isn't it? Yeah. So, we're dip, dip, you know, how we're setting up differently for there? Are we getting a bit more kicker or maybe a bit of Cunningham in for this tight one? Yeah, if it's windy, yeah, a bit more cutting and a bit more, you know, let, a bit less kicker off. I mean, we generally always let a bit more off of the hoist, um, say, just because it's less, you know, none of them start on the side and then, mm -hmm. you know, pull it back on when you get going again. Um, but yeah, you know, a bit more kick around if it's tighter, a bit less if it's broader. Yeah. Board position is obviously pretty, pretty crucial. Um, you know, if it's, you know, when it's too high, um, when it's tight or, it's, you know, too low when it's broad, it's, it's a, often it's a lot of realising that, if it's broad on the second reach, you know, don't feel it's a reach, you know, you know, you could be in a running mode, mm. um, especially by the bottom when everyone's dragged it high, you know, you don't, even though, you know, as a crew as well, don't think that your pole's got to be on the jib, you know, you mm. sail to what, you, you know, what wind you've got, not what you think it should be. Yeah. We've got a really good example. It sounds stupid, but it's, um, yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah. So, sorry, I, I missed a little bit of what, what you said there. I don't know if everybody else did, but board then. So, just, just remind me again what you're saying about board. If it's, it's broader versus if it's tighter? Yeah, well, it's, I mean, it obviously depends on the wind, but, you know, you don't want it all the way up if you're on a tight reach, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, you don't want it all the way down if you're on a, on a run. You know, you generally the helm will have a bit more feel with that with what's going on in the rudder. Um, yeah. But you should, you know, generally you'll have a... You'll, should vaguely know where it should be from for reaching tight and reaching low. Yeah. Um, I don't know the exact fraction of what how far it goes up off the top of my head, but I know it's about there when I look at it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, this is something I've uh, sailing with Tim, who who grew grew up sailing on the sea at Hollyhead, and um, you know I've never experienced it with any other helm, but it, he'll go. Oh, I've got too much board here. And, you know, yeah, you can, as a helm, you should be able to, you can really feel it in the rudder. Yeah, um, you, you can feel the sort of screw, you know, the, the, the twisting effect going on. Yeah, yeah. It's almost off. like a sweet spot you can feel. If yeah. you pull it, up, pull it up a little bit more, you know, on a, generally on a reach, if you just give a little bit less board, you'll just feel the boat pick up a bit more. Yeah. Um, yeah. Generally, we, we find. Yeah, okay. So I, I kind of let him do that. And um he, he usually finds a good opportunity to stop sitting out, or he'll find any opportunity to <laughs> and, um, go and go and do some essential tweaking, as he calls it. <laughs> yeah. So, well, well, um, I mean, another. I know it's getting off topic slightly, but another part of that is, as a crew, you know, you should be going out helming. Mm. Um, you know, it's it's a great way to learn how to get better at crewing is to go out on a helm. Yeah. Um, yeah and I say, I don't, know, I don't go off topic too far because I don't, you know, drag it on too much, but. Yeah. It's, you know, again, it's knowing I've sailed this condition as a helm and I'd want the board roughly around there. And it's just mm. having that instinct to, to do it and know yeah. what the helm would be wanting at that point. Yeah. Okay, good. All right. So as you've seen in the video, we've um, we got to the top mark for the second time. So we're, we're going on the run now. 
Uh, he's still in third place behind, behind Fergus and um, uh, Mike. Now, yeah. unfortunately, it doesn't show us what happens on the run, but uh, when we get to the bottom of the run, um, you're in the lead. Now, uh, you, you, it looks like you just get water. I'm just trying to find it now. So we're... Doo -doo -doo. Let me just see if I can find it. Here we go. So you've got past Mike. Uh, yeah. You're just about, by the look, I think you get a big wave here and you just get water on Fergus, which was mighty handy wave, but yeah. Ian obviously timed it. Um, so what, what the heck went on on that run for you to be taking two boats like that? Um, probably that wind pressure and, and maybe a bit of a shift. Um, it sounds silly, but when you're, when you're on a run, you know, if there's three of you that are fairly close together, being the back boat is sometimes an advantage. You know, yeah. you can sit on them or you can see what's going on first. As you, you get that shift first before they get it. Yeah. Um, if you, you know, you can see what's coming down from the boats behind you and you can plan for where you want to be at the bottom mark. So mm. you, know, you can tell by that we were inside Mike and Fergus at that point. So we obviously worked down low inside of them or they probably jived off. Mm. Um, and then coming back up, it's just being in that right position to, to get there. Mm -hmm. um, the one thing Ian's really good at is that, um, you know, with through a lot of team racing is setting up from, you know, where yeah. the best way to approach into a mark to get, you know, so we know we're going to be in the best position. Yeah. Um, but I say, you get to the bottom mark, that, I mean, we'd probably been discussing that bottom mark or think, you know, Ian had been thinking about what had been going on from probably, you know, three quarters of the way up the run. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, you know, seeing that the wind's going that way, we can get an inside advantage. How can we make the most of it and how can we make it work? And it's yeah. sort of putting yourself in the right position to the boats around you. Mm. Um, and it says a crew downwind, you're just, again, supplying information to keep the boat going fast. So you're talking about how much pressure's in your kite, you know, whether it's coming behind you or ahead in you, um, yeah. such like that. But yeah, you're thinking... You know, especially on a running thinking boat position going into the mark, you, might, you need to be thinking about that halfway, halfway down the run at least, I would say. Yeah, it's interesting what Andy Rather said. Rather than, you know, five ball lengths before. Yeah. Go on, Phil. It's, uh, it's interesting what Andy said about Ian being um, team racing because Andy, who I sail with, he, he was also um, a very successful team racer when he was at university. And it, it does make a difference um, having a helm that's had experience um, in, in the likes of team racing because they are planning you you approach the mark um quite quite far ahead and then it's just a case of feeding them the information so that they can process all, all their options in the head and uh, decide the best the best route in and, and out the mark yeah. um, we generally run a uh, not a lot of board um downwind um, it's one thing that we're, we're, we're we make quite a habit of because um, we, we try to get nice and low um, as, as much as we can play the shifts the best we can we, we have an advantage um, downwind the fact that we, we we are lighter than a lot of people so uh, when you're going downwind you can can make the advantage um, if you've lost a bit upwind uh, okay okay yeah so just thinking about uh, sort of kicker out all that sort of thing out all full on down the run for this stuff would you say or um yeah to be honest we very rarely just are out all um really even on a reach yeah, yeah. don't right. because we forget to pull it back on yeah uh, <laughs> <laughs> world champion <laughs> no i say if, if you know he says we keep ours is on the boom so we do adjust it rarely but yeah in the windy stuff we generally wouldn't adjust it just just because there's enough going on generally yeah um there's a lot we more have a to do with your speed rather than the, the out hole in those, in those conditions. Mm -hmm. If it's like a, a marginal plane in day, you'd, you'd adjust it a bit to your you know, marginal gains. Yeah. Um, but yeah, generally, you know, on the run, it'd be sort of kick her off and, you know, set you, kick and set your leech and cutting them off, really. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we're the same. We, uh, we, we don't really touch the out hole. I'm sure Andy would inform you that we generally run probably a little bit too much out hole. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, think, uh, I think I used to with Tim, uh, we, we always used to sort of crack it off an inch or so for that first reach and then maybe bang it on for the second and keep, certainly keep it on for the run. But like I say, the risk of forgetting it is... Um, uh, especially like that when you know, you've know you got to go into the boat mm. to pull it back on and things like that. And generally, the, I mean, it's just 
stupid thing to say that we don't let it off because we forget to put it back on. But mm. generally, we it's, we've done it before, and that's generally why we've left it on. In the yeah, it's risk management, that. isn't it? It's all about risk management. And, yeah. Um, you know, if, if that's a risk, then you you, you sort of say it's sort of risk versus reward, isn't it? So yeah, uh, yeah. that's a decision that's been taken. Well, okay. So we then uh, you've you've obviously taken the lead at this point, and. Um, We've actually got another reach or a couple of reaches uh, in this. So I'm just going to wind this on a bit now. Uh, okay, so so this is on the second reach. You, you, um, Ferg, so obviously we're focusing on Mike here, or the camera guys is. Fergus is straight through Mike's jib, basically, and you're obviously to the right, and you've got a reasonable uh, leader. You're not, you know, you're not miles ahead, uh, certainly not horizoned it yet, and... Um, so, so Mike's doing his funky stuff like it does. So I think my memory of this reach was this was the tight one and then it went broader. Yeah. And I think also um, it, we were sailing towards the shore to upwind and then the further out you went, uh, as in f further downwind. Yeah, know, the bigger the waves are. The more sea. And we see that. So so Mike's, you know, hammering it along. Um, you can see how tight it is, can't you? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, so, so then we... Uh, move on and um if i can just control this a little better bear with me one second so i think we've gone we've gone past the jibe now and then this is really good now so this is the slightly broader uh uh reach here and you can see you're holding the guy now you're the windward windward sheet the guy yeah which takes a fair bit of effort and fair play to you mate you, have you got reaching hooks on that or do you just grunt it out uh no we've got reaching cleats um but with the angles we sailed, we're moving them so much yeah. that um, it's just best how it, it sort of limits your movement around the boat, you know, a little bit. But, yeah. you know, it's, it's better to have the, the sails going at 100% and say, as yeah. you can see, it flies around the boat a lot sharper than I would do. So <laughs> we can keep the boat trucking and I can um, keep the sails going. Yeah. But I, I say, you see the angle, you know, I imagine the rib's going in a straight line and, you know, you can see yeah. the angle changing that we're doing compared yeah. to the rib. So I mean, this, um, this is, it goes on for a bit. This, so, so, so this, um, this is absolutely brilliant footage. Some of the best footage you'll see of surfing downwind. And um, Ian is, you know, give it Fred Astaire here and 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 more at the way he's tap dancing around the boat. And I could, so talk us through. You, you you you're talking to each other. You know, you're obviously steering for the waves and yeah, and, steering for the waves. I mean, you've got generally in these sort of stuff, you've got one eye in the waves and one eye in your kite. Because um, as well as you know. Fueling your pumping is you're getting the boat flat, giving it a pump in your waves, but there's also mm. fore and aft movement in the boat to get you know your, your trim right. Mm. Um, and again, you know you, you're discussing, you see the wave coming, you can generate a countdown, you can see you know you can go forward and slide forward. It just helps the bow, you know, get over that wave and you know give you a bit more momentum. Yeah. Um, essentially, it's legal. You you know it's it's nothing frowned upon for renewing it. It's all part yeah. of the you know all part of the parcel. That's it. Um, you know. We make the most of it really yeah i remember ian saying it at sligo uh, that it was the first time i'd experienced um uh, a jury boat being out there and uh yeah he absolutely loves it and i was thinking oh dear because we just freeze whenever the jury boat comes past but if you know the rules uh, well yeah that's that, you know if you generally if you freeze when your jury boat's there they're going to stay with you because you're, yeah. you're obviously <laughs> yeah. something wrong um, <laughs> you know if you're uh, if you're saying by the rules and it's fine, you know, it's, it's not, and it's not an issue. It's when people sort of say, oh, they're pumping, you know, they're doing this, they're doing that. And it's, yeah. if you get a jury book going and they're not flagging you up for it, it's purely legal. Yeah. Um, I say it's, it's not anything extreme. It's, you know, you just, you know, you're making the most of the waves that you've got and the, in lieu, especially the big waves that make a big difference. Yeah. So um, it's, it's knowing the rule, as you say, and it's knowing the, the one, one, pump per gust and one pump per, per wave. Yeah, it's, like it's one pump. Make it the biggest bloody one you can do. <laughs> in every situation possible, you know. Yeah. You're allowed to do it, so, you know, do it. <laughs> exactly. But, I mean, that, that, that scene there, and I'd encourage anybody to watch that with the, with the sound on, because the guys in the boat uh, are doing a little bit of running commentary. And it's a shame, in a way, that they don't look back every now and then, because they're going like... Uh, well, he's he's moving here, isn't he? He's, yeah, but he, he's he's working for it, and and then he's and then they're going. Um, he must have pulled out about hundred yards in in like the last thirty seconds or whatever. And so, just 
from that, I mean, bear in mind who's behind is Mike and Fergus, who are no slouches. But you know, you've you've got to the bottom mark here, and I think it just cuts, unfortunately. But assuming it's in, you know, these these are some way behind you now. Um, yeah. And, and you've, that technique that you've done there uh, has really, you know, you've just disappeared now. And you can see the rest of the fleet are down in St. Ives by the look of it. So um, it, that's it's a cracking bit of footage that and uh, really demonstrates, I think, the, you know, the, the, the movement that you've got to put into the boat. Both helmets. Yeah, well, it's, you know, in, in a GP, they're not fast boats. And, you know, generally upwind, everyone's, you know, going the same sort of speed. You know, a, a good B without shifts, you know, you're gaining two or three boat lengths, you know, if you can make... 20 boat lengths on a downwind, you know, yeah, you know, you're taking a lot of that risk of, you know, the beat out of the situation. Yeah. Yeah. But I think it's, a, I think a lot of people will, will sit back corner. Um, yeah. And they'll stay pretty stationary and just know, sort the, of pump the main. That's it. And then the, the kite pole will be on the force day. Yeah. And the fact that actually, that's what I was going to ask before, you know, you've got to, appreciate that the second reach isn't generally a reach you know it's quite runny you know you've got to be you know sailing the angles for the waves and that often makes you you know you know a lot of the time if you get a good wave and you're surfing down it you generally end up being on a run yeah um you know so the pull needs to be moving you know all the time really yeah okay so that's get the most out of it yeah, so that's, you know, you need to be pretty fit and pretty, as we know, pretty fit and pretty strong. But that is for those conditions um, that um, you, you're really going to gain uh, from being able to play the camp yeah. in all conditions and particularly that broader reach down the waves. If, if the helm's doing the business surfing the waves, you've got to be in a position and you've got to be fit enough and strong enough to be able to play the uh, the kite to get the, the maximum from that because that is such a good demonstration that that sequence there of get it right and the, and the distance that it can be made or gained you know if, you, if you're playing catching. yeah no definitely yeah and I say it's, it's being out there and practicing more as well which you know essentially is what it it's all preparation at the end of the day yeah yeah good okay so um we've got to quarter to nine there and we've um, it goes without saying that you managed not to fall out of the boat or anything like that, and um, you, you got to the finish and won that race, which uh, which is good. Uh, obviously, world champions, but um, <laughs> you, 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 you you were beating some pretty fast guys there, and Mike obviously then went on to become world champion uh, at the last event. The so last ones, yeah. So, 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 and and there's a race, guys. Um, I don't know if if that's prompted any questions. Um, from, from anybody uh, on the floor, I guess now's a good time to, to take any, any questions that you may have. They're all very quiet. <laughs> <laughs> well done, Andy, you've covered it all. I've got a question, um, Paul, Paul Bomer. Um, can you um, just talk us through your thoughts about the uh, sheeting angle for the Genoa, with the Genoa, uh, with the tracks on the Genoa? You talked about having the you know the tension on the jib earlier when you were talking about keeping it off the um, off the shrouds and the, the spreaders. What 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 are your thoughts on the sheeting angle itself? Do you adjust that during the race, or and how would you set up for that? Um, I mean, as a, a, a very rough rule of thumb, the sheeting angle should be you know generally sheet angle's coming up. It's generally pointed about two thirds of the way up your fore stay in a GP. Um, we would change it. I say it's it's all. It's all, you know, what's going on. You know, if, you, if you're in the boat and you can look up at the jib and see what your slot's looking like, you know, you've got a good idea of what it is. In, in the lighter stuff, we generally just do it on jib sheet tension rather than jib car position. Uh, we generally only move the tracks in the breezier stuff to open the open the leeches up, you know, pull the cars back, um, flatten the foot off and open the leech. Um, in, the, in the lighter, you know, even sort of medium stuff, we generally do it off sheet tension. Um, so it's, a, it's a quicker react. It's a quicker, you know, it's a quicker movement to do, and it's generally only a, a temporary movement. You know, with with jib cars, it's generally a more of a permanent move. It's harder to adjust them, really. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. 
Uh, Andy, can I, I ask you something, um, which is also to do about um, adjustments, but um, in this case, uh, pole, pole height. Um, yeah. Do you adjust the the pole height um, much for different conditions? I suspect that you do. Yeah, no, we do loads. Um, the, I mean, the rough rule, rule of thumb that I look at is keeping the clues level. Um, you know, so if you're generally lighter winds, your leech is going to be lower. So you generally chop the pole to, to suit that. So you're generally keeping the two leeches, you know, at the same the same height. So your, your pole height and your windward, you know, clue should match the, the height of your leeward clue, really. Yeah, so you're saying in, in general you tend to drop the pole a bit in lighter winds. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah and take it up yeah. in the stronger stuff. Because I think yeah. that, that sort of pretty, is probably, it, it's second nature to you, you know? But for us that are like mid-fleet club sailors, those sorts of things, to make sure that we're doing it like from an expert is really helpful. Yeah, no, no, I say, I, I always look at keeping the clues level. Um, you know, that's what you're, you're looking at at the end of the day. That's what you're trying to, trying to gain. Yeah, but some of us less experienced people know they're not <laughs> going, what am I doing wrong? What should I be adjusting to get them level? <laughs> you, you <laughs> no, just, I say it's always the pole height. You always say, you, you, yeah. how can you just doing that? You should back yourself and go with it. <laughs> I, think, I think sometimes you struggle to see the lured clue. Um, and uh, for me, when, when the luff is, is you, you feel as though you, that you can't, or you, you almost can't get rid of the luff. It's it's so big and heavy, and you, and you just develop a feel for right. It, there's too there's too much curve going on in that now, and I, I just can't keep it on the wind because it's 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 luffing all the time almost. You know, short of looking ridiculous around the side of the the jib. So at that point, bear in mind you're usually shielded from seeing the the lure clue um, when it's getting too heavy go pull down and uh, you'll find yeah. it a lot easier to keep it flying then. Uh, I, I have a question uh, to do with uh, sailing into uh, the wind and into a chop. How much are, are you moving your body fore and aft? And are you moving to keep the boat flat or are you moving to lift the bow up over the wave uh, at the expense of uh, maybe knocking the wind out of the sail a little bit. Um, I mean, for us personally, we generally would do more in and out movements rather than fore and aft. Um, I would generally do it for keeping the boat flat. Because um, the G, I mean, I personally the GP with the weight that's in the GP. Um, though, you know, we tried to keep a fairly level, like flat boat, you know, trim wise, fore and aft anyway. So, Generally, don't try and um, you know do forward and back moments upwind, but more just in and out. Yeah, we generally try and steer through the waves rather than sort of pushing the boat with your body weight up and over them. Um, might lean a little bit back to get up and over the wave, but generally it's it's more about steering the boat um, into the wave and then then down off the back of it to try and maximise the boat speed out of the wave. I think I've been, some, I've been some waves. optimist sail too much. <laughs> I think there's some waves, Curly, where, and you'll know this, uh, it, it, you just know you're going to slam it, uh, j just the timing of the wave or where the boat is on it or whatever. And it, if I feel that's going to happen, I, I'll get back and get behind Tim uh, a bit on the sea because uh, he doesn't sit out very much. That's quite easy for me to do. <laughs> um, but it's, it, you, you know you're going to proper nosedive it and, and it's to anything you can to... to to stop that happening. And it, that may be our technique that's gone wrong before that, I don't know. The, these guys put, uh, are, are probably steering it slightly better, but Tim's, Tim's all right in the sea. Um, but I would, say, I would just say, so that, that odd occasion where you know you're gonna nosedive it or you know something close to that, then I will throw my weight back behind, behind Tim just to keep the bow uh, as up as possible for that moment and then, and then go back forward once you crest the wave. <laughs> The word, thank you. Okay. Have we got any more questions or have we um, informed you all? I think you've informed us very well. We're, we're going almost an hour and a half. It's been a super session. <laughs> I'm afraid I lost a few minutes because a trip switch went. 
uh, just as you were coming into Whitmore and Mark and <laughs> coming up to Jane Mark by the time you're back on again. But uh, excellent session. Thank you all very much. And a big thank you to Anne for setting this up and Paul and Chris for uh, uh, running the session and hopefully recording it for posterity and for the people who haven't been able to make it to this meeting. And I tell you, I shall be recommending this session to my crew. I think there's an awful lot in it, guys. Thank you so much. No worries. No problem. No worries. A big thank you to Dale as well for organising yeah. me and Phil. Yeah. <laughs> no problem. Indeed. I'm a project Good manager job, by trade. And yeah. <laughs> it goes. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Dale. Because, yeah, it was a great session. Thank you. No problem. No problem. No Just problem. a reminder to everybody, we've got um, another talk tomorrow night. Um, Ross uh, and Jane Kearney uh, are talking about grassroots sailing and also talking about uh, Sri Lanka in 2023. And Coleman Grimes is going to be talking about rescheduled Skerries Worlds next year. So tune in tomorrow, same time, different meeting code, but it's all in the uh, pack that was sent out. So um, we'll see you on that one. Uh, guys, just a quick one. It isn't actually Coleman tomorrow, but oh, we've got. Oh. No, it's just been a change. You can't do it, but David Cooper will be on there. So we'll have yeah. uh, Gary's talks then. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. All right. Yeah, excellent, excellent session. Thanks, right, guys. Cheers. Cheers, guys. Uh, thank you. Thanks a lot.